Quite a start, huh? Wow. I don't think I've ever been quite like this before. <laughs> I hope you could laugh with me. <laughs> also, I've read about this in all of the histories, the raised platform for the teacher, but I never sat on one. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I live up to it. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Rishi. Yeah. Make yourself comfortable early. So, yeah, some of you are probably warriors, but uh, it'll, you'll get you'll to stretch yourself. So, you know, I was thinking about, well, okay, what are we going to talk about here, and what should we do, and so on. And I had things in mind, but I thought, wonderful, this beautiful place. It just reminded me again, looking at this Buddha, and all of the beautiful, beautiful uh, sort of uh, symbols and implements and so on of practice that are here. What a privilege to come here. So I'm not gonna really do the history lesson, but um, I learned from a talk that uh, Rishi gave one time at Zen River, um, part of this, um, and then uh, Ekai, uh, although I already had a copy and I hadn't read it, Ekai sent me a copy of a book called Namu Daibosa, which is actually the history of this place. And so one of the things that I discovered, both from Rasheen and Namu Daibosa, is that the root of this place really goes back to Soen Shaku. There's a picture of him somewhere here, I saw it. And uh, he came at the Parliament of Religions, which was at uh, one of those uh, uh, expos, I think it was in Chicago, he came at the Parliament of World Religions and gave a bunch of talks here in the, in the U.S. And uh, D.T. Suzuki, whose picture is right there uh, to see, <laughs> amazing that I'm going to speak in a place where D.T. Suzuki is on it, but um, D.T. Suzuki translated all his talks and compiled them so you can find those. Uh, they're, they're, uh, the, I bought a copy of this in the early 70s called Sermons of a Buddhist Abbot. And um, sometimes now it's published under the title Zen for Americans. Um, but, uh, and so this was part of my foundational uh, introduction into Zen Buddhism. And, uh, no, I didn't have a Sangha, you know, my practice was on my own. My primary meditative practice back then was distance running, like, uh, uh, you know, 6, 10, 15, 18, 20 miles, like that. And just running, right? Just running to run. I had a book that was called The Zen of Running. And, uh, it was uh, how I ran. Always, that's a different story, but uh, I used running as a way to help smoking because I was a cigarette smoker um, among many other vices at that time. And it worked, kind of. Taiji helped me finish the project. But anyway, to get down to the point, um, I thought, well, the privilege here Let's at least have a little visit from some of the people who are seminal in this, right? So this is a poem uh, that uh, Edo quotes in his uh, Points of Departure book um, from Soen. So Soen Nakagawa was a teacher of Edo's, delightful fellow, um, 
And uh, Junpo actually got to have a relationship with him. Several people that I know got to practice with Soan Nakagawa. Um, I did not. He was an artist, a Rinzai uh, priest and abbot. This is uh, one of his haiku. All beings are flowers, blooming in a blooming universe. <laughs> Let's practice with this in mind. <laughs> All beings are flowers. Right? Or uh, as uh, Hakuin said, sentient beings are from the very beginning. So, so here we are with this interesting experience. Right? We wouldn't have chosen it. Uh, it made me think of this. The sounds. If there's anybody who uh, knows Yiddish, you can please speak up and correct me. Uh, something like this: Man tracht und Gott lacht. Right? You probably have heard this before. Um, man plans and God laughs. <laughs> we had all kinds of plans, right? And. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't have plans, you know. This is quite consistent, I think, with the Buddhist message, really. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't have plans. And we have to be careful with that, to think that the teaching of no self and so on and the delusion of our constructed reality and all of that, that it should mean that we are going to find a different place where this uh, function that we have that creates all of this and does all of this will simply go away. I don't think so. I, and it doesn't make any sense to me that it could because we need this capacity as a part of our living. But we overuse it, right? So can we find some balance? So here in a meditation retreat, we're practicing the other way so that we can find some balance. And as we find balance, right, then it's the God, right, Soen's blooming flower. God is in this blooming flower. We learn to laugh, right? We learn to laugh at ourselves. Oh, look what happened. What can we do with this? How do we, how do, we do the best with it? Not just an irony, like from the outside, from the 10,000 foot place, but actually from the inside. <gasps> Look at that. Wow. That actually happened, right? And I'm thinking about our little COVID experience here. Oh my goodness. We tried to make sure that wouldn't happen. Still it happened, right? So Jung put it in a certain, he said, if you've lost your humor, lost your way. And uh, I left a, oh, I didn't bring it. Mm. Well, I'll save another, that for a different day. I forgot the book. I have a delightful story about this from Kafka. Yeah, I left it in the, my quarters. Here we are with meditation in action. How do we face this difficult thing, right? Now, oh, meditation, right? Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, right? Can we drop in and say, oh, now what? Look at this. What's real here, right? And what, does, what do our teachings tell us, right? How do we face this with wisdom and compassion? This is how we face it, right? And in Sangha, at best that I know how, right? And it is for us to face this as a community, to be open to it. So uh, I like to say this to people about myself. I'm just a Zen student, a simple priest, a country priest, the way I think of it. And, you know, I take my... Uh, role as abbot seriously, but not too seriously, 
because I'm just a Zen student here practicing with you, even if I get to sit on some kind of a fancy thing. <laughs> so as a Sangha, we face this. And I really, I want to thank you uh, again, because, uh, you know, in a certain sense, this seemed like a tragedy. And so we face it openly, uh, tell the truth, um, listen, and really you're quite delightful. What a privilege to get to practice with you. Right? And it's not that everybody sees it the same or whatever, but we can be together, listen to each other, try to see what we can accommodate. And that applies to the staff here too quite remarkable, actually. Um, I asked Rasheen to include me in a conversation with Togen. You know what he said to me? This is our practice. With a smile, right? This is our practice. Quite beautiful, right? This is our practice. So, so how do we practice here today? Where are we going to start? And I'm going to pass something around. Um, if we hadn't created quite, a, quite such a stir, uh, I would have uh, asked if I could blow up a couple of these and pass them along. Um, I thought maybe I'm not sure how familiar with the 10 ox herding pictures. Quite a few. Um, I'm going to pass this around. So today, I marked two pages in here, the first and the second page. So I'm going to pass this around and have a look at these, especially those of you who aren't familiar with the 10 ox herding pictures. So this is a, a way, uh, the particular one that I found here is not real artistic, but this is a way in the symbolisms of art, right, to picture stages in, the, in our practice. And my request, some of you have well-developed practice here, but my request is something that's vital. I asked about your intentions. Um, and so I think it's good to, to, to get the real benefit of practice in, in a, in a uh, circumstance like this, in an opportunity like this, at uh, a, such a wonderful monastery. It's a shame we get to be silent, we get to work together as a community. Very important to practice with intention. And so with clear intention in, uh, and uh, in terms of practice. And maybe some of you practice with intention. You know, whenever I sit down to practice, I have a general of practice. So, um, and it is this, practicing menacing, relieving all suffering, dedicating any merit to enlightening all being. This is the intention I practice with. You should practice intention. But also there are times when uh, Circumstances drive me to something particular, right? To trying to see through things. So I, I've struggled with something not long ago that comes from my past, from growing violence and that kind of stuff. I probably, um, but so times, just that, or some confusion that I recognize that I just experienced. So I want to inquire into that confusion and try to see it more deeply. So I think you can, or let's say I have practiced without intention, just sitting, just, you know, just sitting. And I think it's valuable. It's more valuable to practice with intention. Not as, a, not as a constraint so much as a focus, right? And as a part of, we say, maybe cultivating the way, right? So 
cultivating the way in this life. I was saying, if you don't have a, a, a really clear, clearly defined intention for practice here this week, consider using the 10 ox herding pictures and starting as a beginner. Practice as a beginner. You know, um, and just watch what's happening, right? See what this is this time here. And especially for those of you who are see what this is. Pay attention. And uh, we say, don't look away. Right? Pay attention. What's arising? So uh, consider practicing this way. And I think that uh, Suzuki, uh, not DT Suzuki this time, Suzuki, he said one of the, he's known, and has a book by the title of Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. So the Song of Zazen, which we recite before any of these talks, and uh, this was uh, Soen Nakagawa's um, request, actually, as a part of our lineage, that we start each one of these kind of talks with the Song of Zazen. And why? Because it's a very succinct presentation of the teaching. And so whatever kind of wandering around or drivel or silliness we get in together, you've heard a clear presentation of the path. Right? So we do this. But in the Song of Zazen, we have this, this phrase, even those who have practiced meditation for just one sitting, will see all their twisted karma erased. So a lot of times people are baffled by that. Well, what do you mean? What do you mean? So I'm going to ask you this. If you drop in, really be present here, open your heart, right? are you troubled? Now, if you have unfinished business of some kind, right, or some place where you're out of integrity, that can arise, right? And, uh, but are you troubled, right? If you watch that arise and let it go, are you troubled? This is what I think Hakuin was saying. And I don't, I can't read Japanese, so I've never read the, I can't read it in his original writing. But when I recite this, say, where will we find twisted paths, right? Because at least as I practice, each time I sit down to meditate, I practice anew. I practice with openness, with beginner's mind, right? Not, and not with some attitude, because I've been practicing for a while. To one way of thinking, I've practiced my whole adult life because I had to, to overcome addiction um, in my adolescence. But each moment is a fresh opportunity for practice. Each time I sit down to meditate. So I take that phrase, you might hear me. It's not that I don't know that the words, um, it has they in our translation. But I like we because I'm not separate. And this is the same attitude I have in terms of being a prophet or anything, right? I'm just here practicing with you and uh, there can be nothing else right in the in the our version of the bodhisattva vow uh, which which is uh, uh, comes from Tori's uh, primary like uh, foremost student uh, I mean uh, Hakuin's foremost student Tori right called the Bodhisattva vow. And we've inserted this phrase, which we, uh, in our lineage, attribute solely to Lin Ji, but it's actually a Taoist phrase, right? A true one of no rank. So when I, a Bodhisattva of no rank, right? And it's a very important thing, um, because if we practice with some p 
puffed up attitude right, about ourselves. Um, uh, if we practice without letting go of all of the roles and stuff, right, ranks in our lives, all of that, that's a barrier to the complete practice. Right? So we've inserted in what uh, Tori originally wrote, when I, a bodhisattva of no rank, right? one who's committed to service, really, right? an, uh, an awakening being committed to service of no rank. Right? So anyway, enough of my beginner's mind talk. Huh? So, I'm suggesting if you don't have a plan for practice this week, consider practicing with beginner's mind. Start today with that practice. Just observe, right? And the pictures in that book, right? The first one is a guy with a rope, right? He's looking for the ox, right? Who knows what the ox is? What's the ox? Huh? Yeah. Well, or we could, we could, yes, right. To try our mind, right? And to try to see through all the chatter in our mind. What's the real essence behind this, right? Because we have an experience, right, of our, like our subjective experience, our babbling and our uh, construction of everything. We have that. You don't have to look too far to see it, right? You see it all the time. But where does it come from? What underlies this, right? So this is, we're searching for this. So the guy's there with the rope, doesn't see it. And then the next picture is <gasps> hoof prints, right? Jen Ji and I have shared a real interest in a book from uh, Shang Yan, who's actually, this is his version of the 10 ox herding pictures. Uh, and it's called The Hoof Prints of the Ox. It's about finding practice. But uh, so the second picture is <gasps> we see the hoof prints, right? We see the evidence, the trail, right? And so in our practice, right, can we pay attention and start to get a glimpse behind the veil, right? A glimpse of prince. So, and the question, right? The beginner's mind is, well, what is this? What is this? Just curiosity, right? Just curiosity. What? What? Then, uh, and then, what is the construction or ignorance that limits our experience? Right? That's what we're looking for. Right? That's. So what is that, the structures, right, that limits our experience right now, right now? One of the most interesting things that I, I, I Thich Nhat Hanh was another, besides uh, Soen Shaku and D.T. Suzuki, Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, his writings were part of my early introduction to this. And uh, somewhere, I don't remember where it is in Thich Nhat Hanh's writings, I've read quite a bit of it. Um, he talks about trying to understand this point, trying to understand dependent origination or selflessness or the that our perspective is limited. So when we like this, or like the sutra book, we see a book, right? And we open it up and we see writing on the page. And um, I don't know, if you're like me, you probably just usually think of it this way, right? You use it this way. So Thich Nhat Hanh says, uh, well, you could look at it that way, or you can see 
the sun and the rain and the trees and the, uh, the person who felled the tree and the, you know, the paper maker and the, you know, the uh, printer, uh, not just the writer and the words. Mostly when I look at books, I see the writer in the words. And that just opened up quite a vista for me, right? So that's beginner's mind for me. Oh, everything that I see around here that I put a name on, right? And I see it as a structure. That's not the only way to see it. Not at all, right? And when I see it this way as a structure, it's a limiting way to see it. So that seems kind of stupid and abstract, but that's also true in our interactions, right? So if I'm deeply in, uh, enmeshed in the view that I have when we interact, and I don't listen carefully and consider the view that you have, or maybe the view of someone who's outside of the two of us, right? or the three of us, or however many it is, who's looking, right? My view is quite limited then. And my capacity to respond is restricted by that limited view. So the invitation here is, can we open up our perspective, right? Our hearts, our minds, uh, we could say, our energetic tanken, can we open a being far enough to see through the construction that we put on everything and to be willing to admit other views, consider them, right? Can we open up this perspective? Not so easy. I think we can, right? Not so easy. So sometimes people say, oh, yeah, but, but, but what if I lose it then? What if I lose it? This is my experience, I can only tell you, that what is truly mine never goes away. Right? Like my talents and all that kind of stuff, they don't go away, whatever limited talents I have. right? Um, so I can risk that opening up without losing what's vital, right? I'm not gonna lose that. And I can just tell you that, experiment with that, see if it's true, right? What's really vital, you have it, it's yours in that sense. And we need that, right? Because we need our talents and skills. This business about no self is not like not living well. It's about living better, right? Not about not living well. So the invitation is to begin with openness and practice as inquiry, right? Understand the practice is inquiry. What's this? What's, what's happening? And that's true. I didn't get to participate in much Qigong, but I know that the Qigong was beautiful today. That's true whether we're talking about Qigong practice, you know, how is this body, you know, and the energy of it and also the subtlety of it. It's all an inquiry. This is an inquiry. One other thing I meant to say Consider this possibility. Everything you do is practice. You're practicing, right? Like for instance, when I'm not paying attention and practicing the way that I'm describing now with openness and inquiry and all of that, well then I'm practicing closeness and I'm practicing rigid views and all, right? That's exactly what I'm doing. I'm practicing. Everything is a practice in life. Um, and if we practice closeness and uh, uh, rigidness and uh, uh, selfishness and that kind of stuff, well, then that just grows stronger. 
So if we work on practicing openness, recognizing how we're all interconnected, then that grows stronger. And so one other thing I want to make sure that I communicate today, how am I doing for time here? Pretty good, I think. Yeah. So one other thing I want to make sure I communicate, you know, uh, I don't want to make too much out of this. I, I grew up in a pretty tough way in a family that had violence. And it isn't that there were no gifts in my family, but one of the gifts in my family was violence. And, um, <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, uh, in my adolescence, I lived on the street, all that, you know, all that kind of stuff was all part of my life. And why am I telling you this? I got to think about that for a minute. Oh, yes. <clears throat> and so as a consequence of that, I learned something that was a mistake. Right? So I thought that discipline, what I learned is that discipline came from might, aggression, right? in, in many different ways. And kind of like might makes right. That's the way it was uh, to me. And many of us learn this, and so that, in my opinion, many of our parents were trained this way, so they repeat that training for us. And there's a lot of this, or in my case, there was a lot of this. Uh, but this is even true in our schools. Like the view, it isn't maybe the best view, and Rasheen should probably slap my hand, but because uh, she's wonderful. But, a lot of that training is like the, the discipline to come from criticizing negativity. At least that's the experience I had. And I learned that lesson too well. So this is what I know. And I, I want to make sure that I share. Punishment, that kind of negativity of some kind, is only impeding behavior. Does not work as it and I like Junpo have the view teacher so what we're trying to do when we're teaching the Dharma or something like that in a certain direction but you are your own teacher what I mean by practice is inquiry can you practice with a beginner's mind right because you're a pay paying attention to that and the deeper part of yourself pays attention to this, or what, what we could call Buddha nature, however, whatever term you want to use, paying attention. If you're confused, like I have been much of my life, then you think that when, I, when, when you find yourself drifting from quite where you want to be, then you think about whipping yourself or knocking off, you know, I screwed up again. Stupid Byron, right? Like that kind of stuff. And those are the messages. Uh, actually, I, I, this is sort of funny. My mother used to uh, call my mother and me, you little devils. <laughs> so no wonder I went and lived in the street. <laughs> <laughs> okay, mom. <laughs> now I know. So uh, about a relationship with my mom. I, I'm not criticizing her. Um, I've had difficulty. They came from difficult backgrounds. They just did the best they could do. The point I'm trying to make here is that the discipline that we want with ourselves, it can be firm, but it is the same discipline you would apply to a little child. Right? It's a loving discipline. It's a positive discipline. So we're tempted to do this kind of crap with ourselves when we find ourselves not quite pointed in the direction we want to point in, right? So when you're meditating and you can't sit still or your mind won't relax, right? You want to do this. Well, to begin with, meditation is being with what is. 
And if your mind has got a flow of ideas right now, just let this happen. See it and let it go. It will go away on its own. You don't have to do this kind of thing. And when you do this, it actually strengthens that. Right? So the practice that I encourage you to do is when you discover that you're off the path you mean to be on, at the point of discovery, smile, right? Smile to yourself and say, ah, here, I'm back. This is the opportunity, right? And in so doing, you're strengthening that. You're strengthening awakening, strengthening your practice. And if you do it the other way, your practice doesn't really grow because learning does not occur through negativity and punishment, not real learning. And what we're doing as we cultivate the way is learning to unify our mind. So all of that part of you is listening. And when you're doing this, you're not rewarding the part that you want to grow. So when that part arises, right? And that's your awareness. Oh, I'm thinking again. Oh, you know, I was uh, uh, in misery at the moment. Oh, it's awful. It's kind of cold here. You know, I am cold. It's terrible. I'll never make like that kind of crap. You just discover that. You say, oh, my goodness. Look what I was doing. I, you know, that is the moment, right? You're back. So celebrate that. And that's how it grows, right? It doesn't grow well. There's lots of stuff in Zen about sternness. I don't know for sure what to make of that. Uh, I think of it this way. When I think about where that came from and who was practicing, I think of it kind of like a boot camp because it was a bunch of young guys, and young guys uh, seemed to respond to a firm hand and authoritarian leadership and all of that. And there's a few young people here, especially by my standard at this point. <laughs> I always used to be the youngest. I'm not the oldest yet, but I'm not the youngest. Um, so you're not boot camp trainees, are you, right? So be careful with all of this stuff and the you know, harsh discipline because I don't think that's what you need, right? And so nourish your growth, right? You are your own teacher, really. I mean, I take, I got up here on this fancy seat and uh, I'm serious about it and I, my heart is yours, you know, my being is yours. I'm here in service and I mean it. And I take that seriously. But also, I know you're your own teacher, right? And whatever I have to offer, as imperfect as it may be sometimes, or maybe sometimes it's a golden gem. But whatever that is, all that gets through is what you choose to let through, right? So you're, you're uh, what do they say now, curating this. You're curating this. But you're doing that with yourself. So see if you can do it with an attitude of love and positivity. Actually, one of the other little gems of mine is that when we say that we practice compassion and that we practice it with everybody else but not with ourselves, then what this is with everybody else is condescension, mm -hmm. right? Because we're better or too good or and, and that, and then we have this oscillation, not worthy, super, super guy, superman, superwoman, not worthy, super, <laughs> so we want the middle way. Yeah. So my last little tidbit today that fits in with this is an Students can, this is from Edo, right? It says, introduction to the second part of this book. Students can be trained, but should not be bound. 
my hope is that each student can grow freely, right? So here he is talking to us here in this beautiful place that he led the development of. My hope is that each student, each of us, can grow freely, changing freely according to each one's manifestation, without restriction by the teacher and without dependence on them. This takes patience by both teacher and student because it is a process without end, beginningless and endless. How about that? Thank you so much.